Well, good morning, everyone. A happy Father's Day to all of you fathers. Of course, you couldn't have done it alone. Everybody comes and says, Happy Father's Day, and I don't quite know what that means. Have a happy Father's Day. Being a father seems to be enough to rejoice about for the rest of your life, right? <laughs> Somebody said, Happy Father's Day. It was my pleasure. <laughs> All the dad jokes just keep rolling. I'm glad that I'm at that age that it's okay. You guys forgive me. Well, I want to wish a happy Father's Day to all of you um, from my heart. It is uh, one of the hardest jobs in the world, second to being a mother, I think. Because so you have the whole nine-month thing and the whole splitting in half thing. That's hard. So that's why they say, Happy Father's Day. I say, my pleasure. It's a, it's a small thing. I think of... Uh, I think of the words of this man here. We don't make mistakes. Just, just happy little accidents. Let's get a happy, a happy little tree over here. I mean, if there was ever anything to put on that you could go to sleep by, that, that's it right there. I, I, should, I should get a voice like him. Put you all to sleep today. And sometimes we feel that way. Sometimes we feel like an accident. I always say there's no accidents, just surprises. Because God is sovereign over all, isn't he? And we can rejoice in the fact that God's over all. Today we are back in the book of Luke. And I will see if I can get my act together here. Chapter 23, which is the crucifixion of Jesus. It's a very serious subject. And as we look at what God sent to us on Father's Day, the gift of his one and only begotten son, it makes me thankful. Before I forget, Mr. Ralph Camacho, would you stand up? This is Rafael Camacho, newest member to Grace Bible Fellowship. I'd like you to welcome him. You can sit down. You're embarrassed enough. It's, uh, it's a process, and it's, um, it's not that hard. It's not like the dentist. But becoming a member means that you associate with this body and me as your pastor. And now I know I need to keep an eye on you. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, what a tremendous privilege it is for us to be in your word, to be able to see all that you have done for us. Lord Jesus, how you willingly came and took on the most humble form, the form of a servant, and how you suffered and died, and that you did it all with us in view. Lord, help our hearts to receive this great gift on this Father's Day your only begotten son who died in our place. Lord, help us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll leave Bob Ross. Last week, if you remember, we saw Jesus who was guilty of being the son of God, and yet he was innocent of all the other things in which he was accused of guilty of being innocent. We saw Pilate as he presented him to the, the people that were chanting to crucify him. And they wanted him to release a murderer to them instead of Jesus, who had done nothing wrong. Pilate said it himself three times. I find nothing wrong with this guy. He got nervous, had to go back in and talk to him, went back out, went back in, went back out, sent him to Herod. Then he went back out, and he says, I find nothing wrong with him. They say, oh, he claims to be a king. Any kind of a king is going to come up against Caesar. I'll be right back. 
and he went and talked to Jesus in the back room. And he says, is it true you're a king? He says, it is as you say. And he comes right back out and he says, I find no fault in this man at all. Because he was. He was a king, just not of this world. If you remember the characters, we've got Pilate. Pontius Pilate was a ruthless, bloodthirsty ruler and he had started trouble and he was on his two strike rule already and so Caesar had his eye on him. He had brought standards into the temple which they considered idolatrous and so there was bloodshed, swords were drawn, Jews died. There was Pilate and then there was Herod Antipas who had always wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to have him do a trick and perform for him like some kind of a trained chihuahua. And Jesus said nothing to him. And they began to beat him and mock him. And they blindfolded him. And they said, who is it, king, who struck you? And they began to abuse Jesus here in this court. And we were introduced to Barabbas. Barabbas, who was a murderer and in prison for sedition, he was brought out with Jesus as a choice of which would you choose, Jesus or Barabbas? Barabbas, a very picture of our flesh, our earthly nature, our fallen humanity, and Jesus, the picture of heaven and, and humility, and the crowd chooses Barabbas. And so Pilate's hands are somewhat tied, and he releases him, although he will have to stand to give an account for it. He gets before the people, and he brings a basin of water, and he washes his hands openly in front of everyone and says, listen, my hands are clean of his blood. You guys go and do whatever you want to do, but I don't want any part of this. His wife comes to him in the middle of all this and says, have nothing to do with this innocent man. I've had dreams about him. And so he kind of wants to wash his hands. And a lot of people do that with Jesus. And he makes a sign. After beating Jesus with a cat of nine tails, which have pieces of bone and sharp metal, tearing open his back, ripping open all the flesh to the point where it exposes bones. Very often interior organs fall out because there is no longer anything holding them in. Jesus was beaten within an inch of his life and then forced to carry the cross member of the cross, which probably weighed between 100 and 125 pounds. It was then roped onto his arms so he could carry it. They would wrap an ankle strap around his ankle so they would always have control of him. And the Romans were known to pull on it as they were moving in procession, which would make him fall headward forward. The weight of the cross member falling on his open back. This is the cruelness of the Romans. When he could bear it no longer, a Roman went over to a bystander who had just showed up to see what's going on. Simon the Cyrene, and he taps him with either a javelin or a sword, and that means I choose you. And there was a law. You had to go with them and do whatever they said for one mile. And he gets inserted into the story to carry the cross member for Jesus. And as he's strapped to this cross member, he gets beneath it. He's now ceremonially unclean. He's traveled hundreds of miles to be part of the festival and to go into the temple to make sacrifice of which he's now disqualified because the blood of the Lamb of God is now covering all of his clothing. Little knowing that this was the sacrificial Lamb of God. So we looked at his life and we're told pick up the cross and follow him, as Jesus says, before he even went to the cross. And we're to do that on a daily basis. And that's what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. My cross is that I die and I don't get to do all the things that I want to do that my flesh desires to do because I've given my life over to the Lord Jesus Christ because he deserves it. He gave his life for me. He deserves my life, every bit of it. We saw the women as he went. The women were weeping for him and he said, don't, don't weep for me. He says, weep for yourselves because it's going to be the time when barren women are actually going to rejoice that they didn't have any children because in 70 AD, there's over a million Jews who die in Jerusalem. And before that happens, there's a famine 
and some women actually end up cannibalizing their own children. And Jesus is warning of the coming judgment that comes upon Jerusalem. This week, we're at the cross. In verse 43 of chapter 23 in Luke, it says, Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is why I believe in deathbed confessions. Because there's a man on the cross who turns to Jesus and recognizes him for who he is. And he says, Lord, which is the right term, remember me when you come into your kingdom, which tells me we have a hope. On the other side of this, there is a resurrection of the dead. Amen? Amen. We have great reason to hope. Verse 32, <coughs> leading Jesus up to the cross. And there were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right hand and the other on his left. So Jesus was put between two criminals, one on each side. One of the other um, gospels calls them malefactors, which means evildoers. Uh, some people think that there were five crosses, but there were three. Malefactors is another word for criminals or do-batters. That's not really a word. You can see my lack of education in this matter. <laughs> and so Jesus is hung between two thieves in association and identifying with those who are guilty and those who deserve the punishment that they're receiving. It says that it happened on a place called Golgotha, a place you know as Calvary. The word Calvary is the Greek for cranium. So where we get the, the same root word for cranium. It's the same place, the place of the skull, or Golgotha, which is the Hebrew. It's the same place. It also happens to be the same exact place. It's the highest point in Jerusalem where Abraham took his son Isaac and went to sacrifice him there because the Lord told him to. And he tied him up and he said, well, we have, we have the fire and we, we have the, the, the sticks, but where's, where's the lamb? And Abraham says to his son, the Lord himself will provide a lamb. Amen. Or he will provide himself a lamb. And of course, he's spared from sacrificing his own son, something that Abraham was held back from doing, God did himself by sending his son to the very same place as the king of the Jews, as the sacrificial lamb, so that we would all know. And you can see the picture inside that mountain, <coughs> the way the limestone is broken up, it probably looked a bit more striking than it does right now, but you can see the skull in the mountain and that's why it's called that. So there's no question as to where Jesus was. Isaiah 53, nine says that, that he made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. He was associated with the criminals. It's an unusual thing to die as a criminal and then have some kind of a dignified burial. They would typically throw you into a big pile and dust you over with lime and add to it until it was so big that they had to cover it up. And yet the prophecy of Isaiah is that he would die and be associated with criminals, but he would be with the rich in his death. That's an awfully strange prophecy until Jesus comes and we go, oh, I get it. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And when they divided his garments and cast lots, and the people stood looking on. So from Luke's account, we're, we're, we see Jesus who's pleading and praying. You know that the soldiers are putting in these spikes, and Jesus is giving his arms very unusual. You know the criminals are fighting for all they're worth, especially the second one who watches it all happen. So they would have to have soldiers holding them down so they'd be able to drive the nine inch nails through them. They typically lay you down 
and they would drive the last one into your feet. Sometimes there would be a seat on some of the crosses so that you would have a place to kind of rest in between breaths. And they made it torturous and long on purpose. And Jesus isn't concerned about himself. He's praying for others. He's praying and pleading. Then we see the soldiers at the foot of the cross and they're all gambling and grabbing. Like often when somebody's leaving this world, there's a fight over the material possessions left behind. All Jesus had were the clothes on his back. And they're all gambling for it. It's an interesting thing that they would divide up his garments and gamble for one piece. And it's interesting because the prophecy in the Old Testament says exactly that, that both of those things happened at once. And we see the women and the people who are in shock and are just staring at Jesus because what could they do? And they just watched as Jesus hung there and died. In Psalm 22, long before Jesus came, David wrote in verses 16 to 18, for dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me and they divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Very specific prophecy so that when it came to pass, we would understand that Jesus was the one that was sent from the Father. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. It's not bad enough that Jesus is now dying on a cross, but he's getting mocked by everyone. If you think you've got it tough, take a look at what Jesus is going through and your day is easy. He's got the rulers, those who knew the scriptures, they should have recognized Jesus and they're sneering at him and taunting him saying, oh yeah, you think you're the son of God, huh? You think you're the, the one who's come to be the Christ. You, look, you can't even save yourself. He saved others. We see the rulers, we see the soldiers mocking him saying, yeah, why don't you come down off the cross now, big guy? Let's hear all that big talk you've been rolling out. Can you imagine? I mean, what do you and I suffer? A dirty look? Somebody cursing us out? A single finger salute on the highway? And Jesus endured all this. And it says that he continued to say, Father, forgive them. <coughs> they don't know what they're doing. That's, that's Jesus. He's got love enough for all of us, even in the midst of our sin. This interesting sign that is hung up and Pilate specifically words it this way, the Jews were offended and said, don't say he's the king of the Jews. Say he said he was the king of the Jews and that's why he's being crucified. And he goes, what I've written, I've written. Because he said, I find nothing wrong with this guy and he declared to be the king of the Jews. So I'm gonna put it up there. It's points for him because it mocks the Jews who handed him over one of their own for the Romans to kill. And then of course, one of the criminals is blaspheming Jesus as the Christ, as God. You can't blaspheme a human being. You can blaspheme God though. Interesting, it's called blaspheming. And we understand that it was both of them who were mocking Jesus in the beginning because we have four accounts of it. And one of them begins to change as he sees Jesus pray for the people that are hanging him on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Something begins to occur in one of the criminals. In Isaiah 53, it says, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows 
yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement or the punishment for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, the whipping marks, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The gospel is preached all the way back in Isaiah before Jesus ever comes. And the word of this suffering servant comes. It's still an enigma for the Jews who don't understand exactly what Isaiah is talking about. But you and I understand, don't we? As we look at Jesus on the cross. But the other, meaning the other criminal, answered rebuking him saying, do you not even fear God seeing that you're under the same condemnation? You see, he realizes that all three of them today are going to die and have to stand before God and have to give an account. But we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Spending time with Jesus and seeing how he responded and seeing what kind of a man he was produced a change in this criminal's heart. The first thing he confesses is, I'm a sinner. Second thing he realizes, Jesus is not. Third thing, I need a savior. Hey guys, do you know that you're a sinner? Yes. Do you know that Jesus is not? Yes. Do you know that you need a savior? Yes. Then you can say the simplest thing like, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I'm a sinner and you are not. It's very simple. Sometimes we make it hugely complex. It's quite simple. I need a savior. God, come and save me. An interesting thing, three crosses. Nothing is an accident. Everything is purposeful by God. And there are three crosses there. You have Jesus in the center and you have one guy who's hardened and angry and rejects Jesus. And you have one who receives him and will spend eternity with you and me if you know him. This is a picture of the world. This is the choice that we all have. Which criminal do you want to be? Do you want to be the one that accepts Jesus? Or are you going to be the one who rejects Jesus? And we'll have to stand before God and give an account of those things. This is the choice of the entire world on Mount Calvary, presented for all people to see. Are you going to accept God's headship in your life? Or are you going to reject him and do your own thing? You certainly have the freedom to do that but the retirement plan is awful. Now, it was about the sixth hour. By the way, that's 12 noon. And there was darkness over the earth until the ninth hour. That means for three hours, it was pitch black. It was a darkness like what they had in Egypt when there was a plague. It was a darkness that could be felt. It's rather interesting. Then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. The significance of the veil is in the temple, before you go to the holiest place inside that temple where there would be a sacrifice just once a year by the high priest. And by the way, it's at this time that Jesus is being crucified. They would take the high priest and they would tie a rope around his ankle and they would put bells on him. In case he went in there with sin, God would strike him dead and they'd have to get him out and they couldn't go in. So they drag his body out. It's interesting because our high priest had something on his ankle, but it had nothing to do with pulling him out, being unworthy. It had to do with stumbling him while he was carrying the cross. And the, this thing that weighed thousands of pounds, they don't tell you, they tell you it's a veil. They tell you it's a curtain. You know, you think a curtain is something you can push open easily. This is a gigantic, heavy, thick separation, which means you can't come before God. Only one man can do it once a year, and that's the high priest. And it gets torn from top to bottom. God himself tears that veil because the veil is the very picture of the body of Jesus Christ. 
because the death of Jesus Christ enables us to come before God. And now we have unfettered and complete access to God the Father, where before we would need a substitute. But Jesus was our high priest who did it once for forever so that we could approach God. Aren't you glad? Yes. I am. The heavy division between God's holiness and man's sinfulness was now broken by the breaking of Jesus on the cross. The perfect high priest had made the perfect sacrifice once for all. And it's at this point that Jesus cries out in a loud voice and he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last or he bowed his head, it says in another scripture. He said with a loud voice, interesting, it's not recorded here what he says in a loud voice until we get to the book of John. John puts it this way in chapter 19, 28 to 30. After this, Jesus, knowing all things were accomplished, and that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine. They put it on hyssop, and they put it into his mouth. And then Jesus had received the sour wine. He said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. It is finished to telestai. The debt is paid in full, is what that means. Jesus said that about the opportunity for you to have your debt forgiven before God. He paid it. And through simple faith in his sacrifice, we have new life. Amen? Amen. The one between the two thieves who was prophesied of, the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the lamb of God, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the son of David, born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, the suffering servant of Isaiah, the son of man from Daniel, and the son of God has paid the price for the redemption of our souls. That's about the simplest way I could put it. How many of you have come to understand that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God? Amen. I am pleased to see you guys to do that today. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, explains it for us. For he made him, in other words, God the Father, made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So when we stand before God, it's not on the basis of everything we've done. It's on the basis of what Jesus already has done. If it wasn't for that, we would stand in judgment. But because he loves us, he came and died for us. And so when the centurion saw this, that Jesus released his spirit, by the way, most people that are on death's door, they hold on as long as possible. When Jesus let go of his spirit and the centurion saw this, what had happened, he glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man. And the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and they returned. But all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance and they were watching these things. So Jesus finally lets go. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. There'll be a day in which every one of us does that. And whether you know him or you don't know him will make all the difference. Isaiah 52, verses 13 to 15. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him for what had not been told them they shall see and what he had not heard they shall consider. This is the prelude to chapter 53 of Isaiah. Jesus was marred in such a way that he was marred more than any man. They had torn the beard from his face. They tore hair out of his head. They had beaten him within an inch of his life. And he was beaten around the face and blindfolded. He did not look like himself. 
It says that he was worse than any other man. He did this with you in mind. Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man, and he had not consented to their decision indeed. He was from Arimathea, city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea comes out of nowhere. He's one of the Sanhedrin, by, by the way, one of the 70 men who had voted and condemned Jesus, but he did not, did not vote for Jesus to be condemned. He's an undercover brother. And he comes out of the closet and he goes to Pilate and asks for the body of Jesus. Do you have any idea what's gonna happen to him when all of his other fellow Sanhedrin people find out about that? He's gonna be completely ostracized and cut off. He's risking his entire life and reputation to go and ask for the body of Jesus. But he does it. And he steps forward. He steps out of the darkness. And he doesn't do it alone. There's actually one other that joins him. I'm sorry, I get ahead of myself. Isaiah 53 says, he made his grave with the wicked because we saw that he was with the criminals on the cross, but with the rich in his death. And this is him. Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. We find out from John chapter 19, verses 38 to 39. After this, Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus and Pilate gave him permission. And so he came and he took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing the mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. You've got two rich guys that show up, both of them very well placed, and yet were not consenting to Jesus' death. And they come out of the closet, and suddenly they're the ones who are taking Jesus down off the cross during a Jewish holiday, and they're going to get a bloody mess taking him down, and they're going to disqualify themselves from being able to worship. It's at a cost that we identify with Jesus, always. And when he took it down, notice Jesus' body is called an it, not a him, because he's not there anymore. Then they took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. That day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. They were running out of time. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. And then they restored and prepared spices and fragrant oils as they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. So they take Jesus down from the cross, which was a very difficult task. And they carry him to a nearby tomb, a garden. We know it, where, where Jesus would go. Takes it into a tomb. We find out from John that it's Joseph of Arimathea's personal tomb that he had chiseled out of rock and nobody had gotten put in there yet. Joseph being alive, didn't need it. And it's okay, he's only gonna need it for three days. <laughs> and so they take him to the tomb and they roll the stone shut. And you guys know what they do, they seal it. The Jews, even on a religious holiday, they're not supposed to do it. They go to Pilate and say, listen, you better tidy up this grave, you better guard it and make sure nobody comes because if they take his body away, they'll say that he's risen. And he already said he, would, he was gonna rise in the third day, so you better keep an eye on that tomb. They knew and his disciples didn't get it. And they sealed the tomb with ropes and to make sure that nobody would be able to get in there and put soldiers there to make sure nobody would get in. Not enough soldiers. The chapter ends right there and we're gonna talk about the good news about Jesus Christ next week, his resurrection, 
His resurrection tells me that every word that he said is true. His resurrection tells me that there is a resurrection of me and of you, and we're going to have to make a choice whose we are. If you are a child of the Father, you will see him. We've had a number of people leave us recently. I can tell you if they know the Lord Jesus Christ, we will see them. If they don't, we will never see them again. I take comfort in the scripture when it says that the Lord delights in the death of his saints because they join him. And I believe that with all my heart. We have been given the greatest gift that God ever gave anyone, the gift of his only son. I think of Father's Day and I think of our Heavenly Father and I am so glad to be related to him above all. I pray that you are as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to look at again this greatest gift that you gave to us, that you came and you died. You suffered all of the persecution and you did it so that we might have a relationship with you. That our sin might be done away with, that the guilt of our sin, the power of sin might be taken away from us and that you adopt us into your family. Every one of us has always been your creation, but not all of us are your children. Lord, I pray that you would work in the hearts of every person here within the sound of my voice and bring us into a right relationship with you wherever it is that we are. Make us fully yours. In Jesus' name, amen.